so excited to have all of you, especially soon you. I'm going to be your host today. I'm with Dweebs Global. For those of you who don't know, Dweebs Global is an international mentorship nonprofit, and we provide free mentorship to anyone who needs it in every area from writing careers to legal careers to tech careers. Just go to www.dweebsglobal.org slash contact, and we will be happy to pair you with the one-on-one -on -one mentor. So today's amazing seminar is going to be about branding. It's going to be about creating this personal iconic advantage to market yourself for professional success. Sun Yu, who we are so honored to have here today, is an international speaker, award-winning author on innovation and design, and a Forbes contributor who has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Entrepreneur Magazine, and the New York Times. His book, Iconic Advantage, challenges businesses from Fortune 500 companies to venture-backed startups to refocus their innovation priorities on building greater iconicity and offers deeper insights on uh, establishing timeless distinction and relevance. He most recently served as the Global VP of Innovation and Officer at VF Corporation, parent organization to over 30 global apparel companies, including the North Face, Vans, Timberland, Nautica, and Wrangler. Truly incredible background. We're honored to have you here, and I will turn it over to you soon without further um, further ado. Thank you much. Thank you, Zari. Um, anyway, well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, I guess, depending on where you're in the world. In fact, if you don't mind, um, just because it's a small group and I always like to get a sense of uh, where everybody is and uh, feel at least a little closer to you in terms of a, a bit of knowledge. If you don't mind going back and renaming yourself, you click on the participants and then click under your name and then there's a tab on the uh, right or, or drop down you can just click on and you can rename yourself. And if you don't mind just putting where you're located, it'd be great for me to just get a sense of where everybody is. Um, Anyway, I'm very excited. I was very excited to be asked to uh, be a mentor. I love being a mentor. It's such a, a great honor. And um, I also really wanted to actually commend everybody that's participating today. Uh, you guys have made a commitment to uh, um, better yourselves. Um, and, you know, one of the books that was, I think, seminal for me when I was uh, young in my career, I'm not young anymore, but when I was, was the book uh, Seven Habits. I think you guys are probably familiar with that book. And there's sort of two concepts we will be uh, leveraging today. One is this idea that, um, you know, those who are successful in life, and when I say life, it's more than just being you know, successful in your career and getting promoted. Um, it's a lot more than that. It's being enriched. It's being fulfilled. It's being self-actualized in whatever way that's important to you. And it's also living your values in a way that creates meaning for you um, and um, creates meaning for those you love. And so um, one of the key uh, ideas in that is this idea of um, quadrant two. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but um, uh, Covey talks about there's the uh, quadrants. If you were to break it up, there's urgent and non-urgent on one axis, and then the other is important and not important. And what happens is we spend 90% of our time on the urgent and important stuff, and probably the, the remaining 9.9% of it on the urgent, non-important stuff. It's always the urgent stuff that tends to be the fire drills that take up our time. But what you guys are doing today and what you're doing by participating in such a wonderful platform like Dweebs is quadrant two, which is the important but not urgent stuff. And uh, studies have shown that the, it, how do you say this, um, the more, percent of your time that you can actually dedicate to stuff like this, which is education, self-improvement, training, development, which are not urgent, but very important. Over time, those people tend to be more successful in life. And so again, I commend you guys for um, really, you know, a commitment to quarter two activities and commitment to yourself, not only to prove yourself for yourself, but for those you come in contact with and those that you touch. Um, so um, with that in mind, that's one of the key concepts we'll talk about today. The other is this idea of, um, uh, there's a chapter on beginning with the end in mind. And part of that is definitely thinking about the end in mind, but part of that is before starting the journey, let's get grounded on who you are and where you're gonna go. Um, sometimes people are so busy chasing after where they're gonna go, they forget to be grounded first because 
um, you know, where you want to go should be an extension of who you are already, what you believe, and because and, that creates the ability to have longevity in that. If you're always chasing after things that look like shiny objects, but they're not congruent with who you are, what you believe in, what you care about, and also don't leverage off of your current or your, your existing personality and interests, it's always something where you're going against the grain and it's going to make life just that much more difficult. So we'll talk a little bit about that also today. Um, I am not what you would call a personal branding expert. I kind of fell into it. In fact, the whole idea of branding, I kind of fell into it. It wasn't like, you know, I went to college and studied branding. That wasn't really the, the intent of any of my studies. Um, a lot of what I learned and wrote in the book was really an outcome of the circumstances that I experienced. And a lot of that was actually around failure. I, I'm one of the, I always talk about, I'm one of the uh, biggest failures I've ever met, okay? Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've probably had to shut down multiple businesses. I've had to do over six rounds of layoffs. I've had to, um, probably over 30 uh, new products I've launched did not see the light of day in the marketplace. And for those of you in the U.S., um, my credit score is, is at one point was as bad as you could get. Um, I got the bottom, which is 300. And that, you know, you can't use 300. It's really hard. It's uh, only point some percent of the population ever achieves that. And I have the um, distinction of actually achieving it twice in my life. So <laughs> this idea of failure has been actually a big part of my life. And that failure has always been an inspiration for me to actually think about, well, how do other people do it better? And what can I learn from these failures? Um, and marry that up with the idea that I am a brand nerd. I, I fully admit I love brands. Um, you know, many years ago, I, 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 I grew up with a brand that actually went out of business and I was really upset about it. It was Twinkie, uh, the Twinkie. You know, I don't know those are the hostess uh, little uh, desserts that are yellow with a white cream in it. And I was really upset because the, the Twinkie brand, even though I hadn't eaten it for many years, embodied a lot of and sort of held a lot of my uh, childhood memories. And so, um, you know, this love of brands, it's something that I've always had uh, for a long time. And the desire to figure out how people were able to be more successful in business, to commercialize new ideas and new businesses, married with my nerdiness around brands, led to this investigation of what actually makes certain brands more successful and more lasting than other brands. That investigation led to looking at 50 different companies, a lot of pattern recognition, a lot of sort of diving into their best practices and their key principles that they followed. And through it, I kind of learned, wow, there's a lot of intentionality in terms of building timeless brands, brands that actually become standard bearers for certain um, you know, categories, certain niches, and become the standard bearer in such a way that they actually become iconic and known for that key distinction that they are the standard bearer for. And that's what led to writing the book. Um, and what happened in the process of doing this is I learned a lot about, hey, the best practices of branding, because that's the first step that people need to do is if they're going to create a timeless brand, what is the brand, right? And um, I looked at, at 30 different uh, brand DNA models. And you'll see the one I'm going to share with you today is the most simplified version of the 30 I've seen. And I distilled what I thought was the most essential element. Some of them were overly complicated. Some of them required, you know, two or three months expiration. And I don't think that's really that necessary in terms of getting the essence of who you are and being able to use that as a cornerstone to build from it. So that's what I'm going to share with you today in that framework. Um, and so I, I guess I get hired by a lot of different companies um, to do this type of exercise. And in the process of doing that, a lot of the leaders, CEOs, executives, C-suite folks say, hey, could I take these same principles and apply it to my own self and my own career? And the answer has always been yes. And so I would say about half of my clients um, first engage me not only in doing the branding of their businesses, but then the executives say, can you actually do this on a personal level for me? And I've done that. And I've even taken it as far as a um, couple of executives have asked, hey, my child is going into high school or, or he or she is in high school. Can you do it for them as they think about how to build their brand in a very competitive world of applications for uh, colleges? And so um, this brand exercise has worked 
across the board, both for big corporations like Nike, all the way down to uh, junior high school students, okay? So it should hopefully work for you today. And I'll do my best to try to honor your commitment to being in quadrant two. And let's leave some time for you guys. I'm sure you're gonna have lots of questions. So let's just dive into it, right? I am going to share screen now. Great. By the way, I'm looking at who we have. We've got people from Virginia, India, Maryland, Florida, Paris. All right, UK, great. Thank you guys for letting me know where you're at. That's wonderful. Oh, Missouri. Oh boy. Um, great. Okay, good. All right, let's go to this. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Go to presentation mode, fantastic. Okay, so as we mentioned, I wrote a book on um, the best practices of building timeless brands. And eventually those brands with longevity uh, become iconic. And the key about becoming iconic is that you actually own a mind share in somebody's not only mind, but also in their heart and honestly, in terms of um, their belief system. Because if you think about iconic brands, we use them oftentimes to identify ourselves. Um, you know, I, I, I work with Tory Burch and what are they? They're leather sandals, okay? For the men who don't know that, but they're basically leather sandals. Um, and I kind of compared them to another leather sandal that's very iconic, which is Birkenstock. Uh, you guys probably familiar with those. Two different brands, both very iconic, but they stand for different things. And when you wear a Tory Burch versus wearing a Birkenstock, both leather sandals, you feel differently about yourself, okay? Um, and it's funny, I asked the folks at Tory Burch, well, are you guys a Birch or a Burke? And they said, well, it depends. It depends on who I'm with, what I'm doing, and, and what I feel like, because I will have the ability to participate in each brand and by wearing that brand, if I'm going to have brunch with my girlfriends on Sunday in Upper West, I'm probably gonna wear my birch, okay? But if I'm going on a picnic in the Catskills, by the way, I'm not from New York, so I'm hoping I'm getting these uh, geographic references right. Um, uh, you know, I'm gonna wear my birch and, and I'm going to have a totally different mindset and feel. And that's the way iconic brands have. They have a certain hold on us in terms of uh, representing who we are and what we believe. Like my favorite brand of all time is Porsche. And, uh, you know, I I've been fortunate enough to go to the Porsche driving experience. And sitting in that car is just such a different feel than when I had a Toyota when I was in college. Okay, So, you know, no, no, no knock against Toyota, but it's just different, right? And so, you know, that's the, that's the value of having great brands that are iconic. So what do we learn about what great businesses like Nike, like Apple, like BMW, like Burberry, like Amazon, like Google, what their best practices is in terms of building brands, what might we be able to steal from that and use it for our own personal brand? Okay, so let's take a look at that. So first thing we want to do is kind of unpack this question, what makes something iconic. And I looked at these 50 brands, some of the ones I just mentioned, and you know, it's very clear there's three qualities that all these iconic brands actually possess and that the management team actually focus on in order to protect their iconicity. And that is these. First and foremost, there is something about that brand that is distinctive, something that makes it stand out versus the competition, something that they are known for versus somebody else, okay? Think about how that applies to you, okay? Is there something distinctive about you, all right? Now, what's important about it is they're not just different for different sake, okay? They're actually, whatever that distinction is, it's highly relevant to the audience you want to be iconic to. Now, the audience you want to be iconic to could be global. You know, you could be Coca-Cola and you want to be, you know, uh, share a Coke with anybody in the world and, you know, spread the happiness. Fantastic. Or you could be like my pay favorite pizza joint here in San Francisco. That's where I'm at. Called Goat Hill Pizza. They only wanted to be iconic to uh, Potrero Hill, which is a certain neighborhood in San Francisco. And so they chose their key distinction as having sourdough crust. And if you think about it, it's actually more than Portrayal Hill, though there's some history of sourdough in Portrayal Hill, it actually also embodies all of San Francisco. So now they're very famous in all of San Francisco, 
for being the only place with sourdough crust. By the way, if you ever come to San Francisco, uh, look me up. Once COVID is over, we can go and share some nice sourdough crust pizza at Coe Hill together, okay? So whatever that distinction is, you want to make it sure that it's highly relevant. So you might be known for something, but if people hate you for it, well, actually, that could work, okay? Um, because it might be relevant in terms of creating a certain type of emotion that you're going after. That's fine. Or let's say you're, you're very distinctive for something, but no one really cares. Well, that's kind of a bad place to be, okay? So it's got to be relevant. And the key, if you want to become iconic, is to have that longevity. And so you've got to do your best to make whatever you're relevant for timeless. So you should be relevant not only yesterday, today, but you should be relevant for that distinctive quality for the next five, 10, maybe your lifetime, okay? That's the goal there in terms of having distinctive relevance. And the last thing is, for those you want to be iconic for, you should be recognized for that distinctive relevance over other people. And that's it. If you can achieve those three things with longevity, that's the key. I mean, that timeless relevance. You have a good shot of becoming a standard bearer. And by being the standard bearer, you have a good shot of becoming iconic. Okay, that's it. Think about how that might apply to us. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and pull it apart. Let's just talk a little bit about knowing these three qualities, what can you do to supercharge them? Well, I talk about three powers that you need to focus on. The first is noticing power. And noticing power is the ability to capture and hold attention. And do you have that ability to capture and hold attention for something distinctive? We talked about being relevant, but it's not just being relevant I mean, a point in time that's being timelessly relevant. So do you have staying power for that relevance? Okay, so that is critical. So like I said, there are a lot of people that change what they're known for all the time, and they have a hard time building a real strong, iconic brand. Um, I think of Pepsi a lot. I, I think they have great name recognition, but what do they really stand for or mean? It's hard sometimes to know because they've changed their logo almost every three or four years. Uh, and they change smoke, and it's, there's just a lot of changes that go on with the brand. And so what you want to be is more like Coke, okay? Uh, and then lastly, it's called scaling power. And again, as we think about our universe, maybe we don't want to be known for our distinctive quality everywhere, but we definitely want to make sure that if we're in an organization, boy, the key people, the key decision makers, our boss, our boss's colleagues, our boss's boss, our peers, our subordinates, you know, our team members, they kind of understand what we're known for and why it's important or relevant for them, okay? So that's really critical that you think about how do you make sure that you are getting recognized for that unique quality that you may have. So how does this idea of creating noticing power apply to businesses and what might we be able to steal from that and apply it to ourselves. So when I think of noticing powers, I think of this idea of what's your signature, okay? So I have to ask Nike, hey, what's your signature? I ask, you know, BMW, what's your signature? I ask all these companies I work with, what's your signature? And here's the test of knowing whether or not a brand has a good signature, and obviously it might apply to you too, and that's this, pull no more than three of your customers, okay, or, or consumers, or in this case, maybe your peers or your sub owners or your box, just three. Is there something that they could say that you're known for, that you actually have a signature? If you don't, you failed the first test, okay, so that's first. The second test on that is, let's say they do actually say something. Are they all saying the same thing? Are they saying three different things? It's hard for any business to be known for three different things at once. All right. So your goal is ideally everyone's saying the same thing. That's test number two. Test number three to see whether or not you have a strong signature is, is that signature relevant to them? It might be something you're known for, but honestly, they just, they're ambivalent. They could care less about it. It doesn't matter to them. That's not good. Okay. So is your signature relevant? The last test, the most important is, is it unique? and different than everybody else? Or is there 20 people in the same organization or are there 20 brands or, or 20 accounting firms that say the exact same thing you say? Well, then you might need to think about how might I be more specific 
about my signature? How am I to give it a stronger reason to believe when people talk about, oh, wait, yes, everyone says this, but we're the only ones that can do A, B, and C on that. Got it, okay? So same thing applies to us. So what are good signatures? Well, let's, let's use the idea of learning from brands and think about how it might apply to humans. So when I think about signature elements for businesses, there's quite a few, right? Obviously, there's this idea of the name and the logo. Um, by the way, my screen is blocked. One second, I need to move something here. So I apologize. I was looking at everybody's names and I can't see what I'm presenting. <laughs> okay, so I'm back on. Okay. okay. Um, Name and logo. Of course, you're going to be known for your names. That's great. Okay. And maybe I, I knew I met this one girl before I was married and I, you know, and she only wore purple. I don't know if that was good or bad, but she was known for only wearing purple. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that was her a signature color or whatnot. Okay. But anyway, there, there's idea of signature. So a feature would be the air pocket in the Nike Air, right? It's very clear. Every time you see a Nike Air, whether it's a tennis shoe, a soccer shoe, a, a basketball, a running shoe, it's got that little air pocket, okay? And that's a signature feature. What's great about that signature feature, it actually embodies their key point of difference, which is buoyancy, right? Um, a pocket of, you know, most trainers lose about 40% of their support in uh, their lifetime, whereas a pocket of air just never loses its bounce. So it's brilliant. There's also signature style. I talked about the, the girl that was wearing purple all the time, right? Well, every time you see that checkered pattern, you kind of know that kind of represents classic English elegance for Burberry. Silhouettes are very important. Um, one of my favorite vacation beers, because they're actually that's what they're known for, vacation beers, has a lime in its neck, and it's yellow, right? Um, corona. So, you know, you... you in fact, the silhouette of having the line in the neck is actually critical, and they say a corona is naked without the line. And that's part of its signature element. Um, signature experiences. Um, I talked about going to the Porsche Center and, and trying out uh, the, their signature experience is this idea of the skid pad. You actually drive, and you don't know. It automatically will skid you right or left, and you have to recover. It's like a game. And you know, obviously, you're playing it with a $100,000 car, but it's a fun game, right? Um, and this is a picture of the Land Rover experience. Um, if you've ever had a chance, it's it just, I mean, this is literally what happens. You drive with literally sometimes three wheels or two wheels, and you, you, you realize this isn't just a luxury car. It's actually built for real off-roading. Some people have come to the point where their name and their, and their brand name is synonymous with an adjective or a verb. If you can become an adjective or a verb, you know, let's Uber it. You don't say let's ride share it, right? Even if you're getting a Lyft, which honestly, I like Lyft better. I, I, I find myself saying Uber versus Lyft, right? So owning language could be important. Obviously, spokespeople, uh, and then also a signature point of view. Actually, signature point of views are very interesting too, in terms of thinking about how that might apply personally. So these are different ways that people can create signatures for brands. Some of these would apply to you as you think about how you might build your own personal signature. So this idea of having a signature is key because it might be your distinct selling point when you are trying to get a project, trying to get a promotion, trying to get a new job. Because remember, there's thousands of candidates. You want to have a distinct selling point to one, make you stand out versus everybody, but also you want to make sure, again, it's a selling point so that it has to be something that's desired, appealing, relevant to who you're speaking with. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of creating signatures and distinct selling points. Ultimately, we're trying to figure out for you on a personal level, what's your key point of difference? You know, um, if you've ever gotten a 360 review, they can be very painful, right? Because you're actually getting testimonials up and down in terms of, you know, getting feedback, right, uh, on your performance. And it's just human nature that we focus on the 10 or 20% that's not working. Right? How many of you ever gotten feedback? You know, you're always looking at that 10 or 20% that was critical of you. I would suggest flipping that. 
what's our 10 or 20 percent that people say you just kick ass over everybody else in the organization and my god we could never live without you oh my god that's where you should invest 99 percent of your time now this is in sequence what i will say is for your flaws or your opportunities do the bare minimum to bring those up to a place where they don't become an annoyance anymore, where they're not a gap. Think of it as your point of parodies. Okay, our point of parodies do just enough where it doesn't it isn't really an issue, but do not invest a single iota of, of, um, a minute more than you need to to just bring them up to par. Okay, then take the rest of your energy and triple down on the stuff that shows up that you're kicking ass on, stuff that people know you for, stuff that people love you for, and be better known for that. Be even more nerdy about it. Be even more educated on A, B, and C. Doing classes on it. Being able to talk about the history of whatever you're so good at. Um, you know, Become a mentor for people on what you're good at. There are so many different ways to think about this idea of what are you good at? and doubling down on that as a way to build your personal iconic advantage, right? So let's think about, I was going back earlier to this idea of building a lasting brand, and part of that is this idea of having great, oops, what happened here? I'm not moving. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, I, yes. for some reason, am frozen here. <laughs> Why is that? Pitting escape. Oh my God, my apologies, guys. I don't know. No what's worries going at on. all. You know what I might have to do? Um, somebody's going to have to entertain you for one minute while I reboot. Of course, I of course. Be- Actually, you paused in, a, paused in a great point. This is something that like, is very, it's the core of the crux of my own leadership attitude. I love hearing this. I think it's so important the idea that you're focusing on increasing your advantages instead of fixing your flaws. And you try to create a team as well where everyone's advantages really balance each other and outshine. Um, I do want to take this moment as well to point out our questions. Our chat should be back online and working, but if it doesn't work for you and you can't DM me, you can send any questions that you have to ISV for Victor, A-R-I at dweebsglobal.org. And that if I'm looking at my phone, that is what I am doing. I am looking to see if I have received any new questions. I know some of you have sent questions already. Thank you so much. I have prepared to ask them. So I'm really looking forward to that during the questions and answers section. So yes, chat is working. Wonderful. So thank you, Ajinkia. Chat is working. So you can also just chat me right here on Zoom. Okay. Uh, Looks like I'm working again. Awesome. Back over to Zoom. Okay. Let's keep going here. Pull it back up. See if it works. Okay. Woo! (laughs) Technology. Love it. All right. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about this idea of longevity, right? And it's really around staying power. Now, I said it, I said earlier, on this idea of your key point of difference, it has to be grounded in who you are, what you believe, and where you want to go in life, okay? Because if it's not, you're not going to be able to have staying power with it. So that's why your personal DNA all has to support your key point of difference. Without that, it's probably going to be short-lived and opportunistic, meaning that you'll use that key point of difference um, as it serves its purpose, but you're not going to want to be nerdy on it. You're not going to want to do an innovation pipeline, just focus on improving your key point of difference, right? Um, So let's talk about this idea of sustainability of who you are and what you are about in order to support your key point of difference. And to do that, we need to look at the DNA. And I start, the, I start off with this before we work on signatures for people with this, because this is the cornerstone. What your signature elements are should, at the end of the day, embody both your brand DNA and also be a signal for your key point of difference. Let's go back to Corona. That line is their signature, but it embodies and represents And it's a shortcut for their key point of difference, which is we are the vacation beer. We are the beer that in the middle of winter on the rooftop of a Manhattan party where it's snowing, if you were to crack open a Corona and have it with a lime, we would take you to the beach. 
For those few moments while you're drinking the Corona, we take you to the beach. And that's your promise. We take you to the beach, okay? So your signature element, whatever it is, it should be an embodiment of your brand DNA and specifically of your key point of difference. So let's talk about these four elements starting from the bottom because this is a foundational thing that builds from the bottom up. If you have a key point of difference that's building your brand, it has to be grounded by what you believe and what you care about and what you're willing to say no to in terms of turning down career opportunities or turning down um, you know, you know, money-making opportunities because it violates your values. So what are values? They're things that we care deeply about, okay? And they're principles and beliefs that drive who we are and what we do. Here's a smattering. By the way, I will send this off so that you can send it off to everybody later, okay? So you, everyone just, but don't do me a favor, guys. Don't send it out to everybody, okay? Just Course within not. this group. Please, you guys, I'll, I'll, you'll be able to access this in fact. But here are some. And these are ones that people have shared with me. This is not all. It's not comprehensive by no means. But these are some to sort of what I call spark your curiosity and spark your own personal ideation in terms of what is it that represents what I truly believe and what I care about. And, you know, a principle or value isn't really a value unless there's some way where you actually have to pay for it, where you actually have to say no to something you really want because the value is more important than getting the gratification of what you want. That's when you know it's a real value, okay? It's when we're faced with that ethical dilemma, when there's nobody else in the room but us, and we have to look to our own value system to help us make that decision. That's when we know it's a real value, okay? And I do think values are critically important to ground us um, to make sure that we're not always chasing after the next best shiny object because every shiny object doesn't necessarily fit within our value system. Choose the ones that do, but make sure that they're not against your value system. So that's first and foremost. From there, we can talk about this idea of personality. And, you know, I worked with a lot of DNA folks and people tend to use characteristics to describe your personality. I'm warm, I'm friendly, I'm whatever, you know. I'm cheery, I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm curious. And those are, you know, that might be part of the personality, but I, I think of a different construct. This is something I learned from um, a really uh, smart colleague named Ian Douglas, um, but it's the idea of thinking about personality as archetypes. Archetypes have been around for hundreds of years. They are shortcuts or mnemonic in terms of the motivation of the roles that we play in human interaction and in terms of human struggle and in terms of pursuing life. Um, they've been used through Hollywood. It's oftentimes we identify characters because we automatically understand what archetype they are. And oftentimes we don't need to go much deeper than understand, oh, it's it's, this is the archetype of these, uh, this, this character is the archetype of these two. Oh, got it. So let me just share a shortcut of what I mean by archetypes. Um, here are the 12 known archetypes. You can read deeply about this if, you, if you're really nerdy um, in a book called Heroes and Outlaws. Okay, great book. All right. Um, and, you know, if you look at this, I, I gave you kind of a, a shortcut or a, a map. Um, that sort of mapped onto different types of businesses. But you can do this with Harry Potter characters. You could do this with, you know, Disney characters, right? Um, and what you can see is when you read the title, they already automatically create a um, connotation, right? Uh, most of them do. I mean, you look at it and there's already a connotation of what that person is or who they might be or what's their motivation. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into all of it, except to say, you guys are lucky. I've distilled it for you, so you guys will get this, okay? And what's really important is when you guys are searching for your archetypes and thinking about it, I would say do the process, there's two ways there. Process of elimination. I don't think I'm these nine, I'm more of these three, and then deep dive those three and maybe pick one or two that really 
feels right for you. Most people are kind of a combination of two. Some in, you know, situational might be at home, I'm this way, and then at work, I'm these two ways, whatever. That's fine. You know, you've got some flexibility. Try not to be six things because there's no way you can achieve that, okay? The better, the more focused you are, the more easier it is to live a DNA, okay? When you have too many of these, it's very hard and your DNA feels a little diluted, right? So my suggestion is the most important roles here to consider is what's the goal of the specific archetype? That's really important. So let's say you're a ruler. Well, you go to the ruler column and you look at the goal and it's create a prosperous, successful family, company, or community. Are you a person that loves taking responsibility for the motivation of making the world, things that you touch, the community, the people, your family, more prosperous? And if you are, maybe that's you. You're a ruler. Well, let's say I'm a magician. And what magicians are, the goal is to make dreams come true. I love for win, win, win solutions. I love to find that needle in the haystack, that pull the rabbit out of the hat and surprise people with, I never thought of that. That's such a great idea. That's motivating for me. So I will send this to you. So the first one, the goal is very important. And then the gift of the archetype and the internal desire. Those to me are really interesting. By the way, virtue and vice, virtue is you know what you tend to, the high quality you give. The vice is if you take it too far, you can sometimes err on that side. So as a magician, great virtues, I'm great at transformation. I'm a change agent. I love going into organizations and trying to figure out where things weren't working, how to make things work. But I can be pretty manipulative in terms of how I get people to do what I need them to do. I'm always about making my idea somebody else's idea. And if you take it too far, you know, in some of my early um, 360s when I was in a uh, change agent role, people said, this guy's really political. You know, he's such a political animal. Oh, okay, so I got to kind of be a little more uh, vulnerable and sincere in terms of describing what I want and what I need about it. But still, I'm manipulating people because I want the best way to get an idea done is to make it somebody else's idea. Anyway, you get my point here. So take some time here, go through this and figure out what are the archetypes that really speak to you in terms of both the goal, the gift you're giving other people, and the internal desire? The other interesting one is also a call to action. When you hear that, that makes you really want to do it, right? Okay, so um, that's a good way to describe personality. And then from your archetypes, you can kind of pull out the key characteristics that you feel are dominant and represent your personality. Make sense? A couple head nods? Okay, good. All right. Okay. Now we're grounded in what we believe, what we care about. We have a pretty good understanding of our role in society and with others that are driven. And then that role is really driven by our internal motivation, okay, in terms of what we care about, um, in terms of what we want to give back and the impact we're trying to make. The next question is really important. What's your promise? What, so what is a promise? A promise should be stated as what do you promise to those you have a relationship with? Okay, what will you do for them? And a simple way to do it is complete the sentence. I promise to do what? Okay. Most brands are external. Sure, they're internal, but external in the sense that it's a brand for your branding for uh, to others, meaning that you're not just branding for yourself, you're branding for your family, you're branding for people you interact with, your colleagues, all right? And as people interact with people that are Brands, what is it that I am going to get from you? What is the promise that you deliver when I have a relationship with you, when I do a project with you, when you're on my team, when you're my boss? When That's the, the important thing in terms of what is it that you're promising me if I interact with your brand, okay? Um. And we'll, we'll, we'll share some promises in a second because I'll give you some examples of other people's personal DNA. But what is it that you're promising? What is your mission in terms of delivering something of value to those you interact with? Um, and that works very much on a personal level. And the key now is there's a lot of people probably with the same promise. Point of difference speaks to how are you living your values 
in the context of who you are in terms of your personality, how are you delivering that promise uniquely differently? And that's what the point of difference is. Point of difference should be the point of difference in terms of how you deliver your promise differently than other people. All right? And when you think about points of difference, think of a Venn diagram. It should be a combination of three things. What you're really good at, married with what's going to be impactful for those around you, okay? And then lastly, the more unique or differentiated it is, the more it can be different, right? So the key points of difference are things that you're great at, that people really value, that, that, that has impact on them, that makes you different or stands out versus other people. If you can find that marriage, you've got a good point of difference. Okay, so I'm going to share one. Um, I changed it a little bit, but I had a client, wonderful person, and literally we went through their values. You know, they were very much about integrity. They're very direct, no nonsense, no nonsense, which then really created a lot of trustworthiness. Um, a lot of that trustworthy, trustworthiness was also a result of them being highly responsible. It was a value system of theirs was the high say do ratio. If I say it, I'm going to do it, right? Courage of conviction, another element, okay? Now, interesting, this person's archetype was outlaw creator. They like to fix what's broken. If you look at the outlaw, it's really about seeing things that aren't working. And it's not, see, people think outlaw is just, they're just a rebellion. No, it's like more like Robin Hood. Something's not working, so I'm going to break it to make it work. That's what an outlaw's mindset is. They always try to find things that aren't working and break it apart. And creators are then, once, you know, it's, it's to give form to a vision. And their promise to those that they interact with is to fix what's broken by empowering people to bring new innovation. And their key point of difference when they looked at it versus other people was they actually had done a lot of turnaround. And what was, and yes, they, they had a great strong finance background and that's important for doing turnaround. But what was unique about them versus other turnaround artists was that they had been a recruiter before. So they understood talent so they could both fire bad talent, which is one of the things you have to do in a turnaround is you have to like cut the fat and then they can groom and hire the best talent. And on top of that, they were HR managers, so they understood how to develop people. So they figured out how to get rid of the bad people, keep the good people, and grow them, okay? And so they marketed themselves basically with these qualities to the PE firm that had bought underperforming businesses that were looking for them to be turned around. And this person has, uh, since I've met them, has already done two turnarounds since I've met them, okay? And this was all based on having a firm understanding of their own personal DNA. This next person um, really started out with, hey, I'm very people-orientated. I'm very growth mindset. I'm always thinking about, you know, uh, learning and growth. I'm also very much, in terms of people first, but empowering those people. I'm also, uh, I'm very humble and I'm very generous. And I can't read the last one down there. What is that last one covered up? Uh, oh yeah, mentorship. It, it sort of fits this idea of empowerment, right? Okay, great. Um, so, um, and they also share the quality of the magician, which is again, improving the world transformation, making dreams come true. And they were a caregiver, right? So it was about empowerment, compassion and helping others. And their whole promise in life was to inspire you to realize your full potential. Um, and what was unique about these folks, or this folks, this person I met, was they failed in life. Not a lot, not as much as I did, but they failed in life. And the key thing about when they failed is that they had empathy for others who were going through similar struggles, difficulties, and had failed similarly, okay? But they also had the credibility to talk about rising from the ashes, the rags to riches story. And what allowed this person to, once they did their DNA, they quickly realized they were in the wrong role in life and in their organization, and they quit their job. And now this person has been a successful executive coach for the last eight years, okay? So 
oftentimes doing your own DNA can give you insight into the question of, am I in the right place in the right role with the right people? And if you do it, maybe you realize, no, because my boss doesn't understand who I am, can't leverage me. The organization doesn't really congruent with my values or the promise I have is so different than the promise of the functional area I'm working on. I've got to change my functional area, okay? And guess what? No one understands my key strengths. I've got to be in a situation where people are leveraging my strengths versus always harping me on my weaknesses, right? So this, this exercise is really important on so many different levels as you build your personal brand. So I'll leave you with the question. What's your signature? And what's the brand DNA that supports building your signature? That's all I have for today. We are at the end of the hour. I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much for coming. I would commend all of you guys to check out http slash www.sonyu.com. You can check out Soon's book there, The Iconic Advantage, which has tons more tips like this, just great resources to be able to create your own brand. And as always, if you have any questions or you want free mentorship and brand creation, website design, how to fix your resume, do your LinkedIn profile or anything else, please reach out at www.dweebsglobal.org slash contact. True honor to have you here today soon. Thank you very much for coming. You bet. I'll make sure the slides get to everybody, okay? Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. We'll send them around. Thank you. Take care, everyone.